talk to you a little bit more about the recognitions. So a wrap up um, review. And it's daunting uh, because it's such a big book and because as I say in my notes here, just kind of jot it down, it's encyclopedic. Um, which is sort of part of the allure for, for, for some people, but it's, it's a, it doesn't, it's not sustaining uh, to, to only have it be kind of, to only be drawn to it because of all its references to other works of art, um, isn't quite enough. And there is more to it. That's just, that's just one thing. And so, uh, my thoughts are just going to be rambly. I'm, I haven't really structured them because I just don't want to. <laughs> um, I'm not teaching a class on this. And so, but I did want to say a little bit more about it. So uh, the book was published in 1955 by William Gaddis, as you know. And just something I remember reading in the interview with him that I found from, I think, the 80s. He was humbled by the lack of response to this novel. He, he even admits that he, you know, he would not have been too surprised to receive the Nobel Prize for this novel. <laughs> but he, but it's sort of like framed in the sense of the the um, the hy hybris hubris of youth. So he's he's honest about that, which I do appreciate because you know it is a fantastic novel, and and yet it received very little recognition when it first came out. And I think part of it was, I mean, irony of ironies, it kind of, one of its themes is that it's, it's a criticism of the American way of life in the 50s. So in a very basic way, kind of the Mad Men-esque rise of consumer culture and advertising and the, the sort of fakeness associated with that is, is one of the themes. And it's as if, well, yeah, sure. So of course that fake world isn't going to respond or isn't going to take notice of this highly, highly um, learned book that has all these references to art and religion and not just any kind of references, but very complicated references that that I can't keep up with. Um, starting with the name. And so the name of the, the title of the book, recognitions and I'm gonna be right back and so yeah for example I just paused then to go look at the the meaning behind the title and I already fell down another rabbit hole of because it's so complicated and that's just the title you haven't even started this 950 or so page novel and so the title of the recognitions goes back to uh, early uh, early Roman literature connected to perhaps pope, up an early pope pope clement the first um who was in office as pope from 88 to 99 but he really didn't write these that's why they're called pseudo clementine um literature and one of them is called the recognitions and so yeah and of course there's connections to the novel and it does even, it is even referenced at some point in the novel, but I'm not going to even go there because, you know, this is, it is a problem with the novel is that every, every uh, reference leads you to other references. And, and then, it, and, and I know one text that I was looking at, critical text was calling it, it is like a hypertext. It does has, has, it does have that quality of a hypertext. And so you can, and so what I'm trying to do here is give you a sense of if this is something that is, already kind of putting you off as a, as a, you know, a text that is extremely referential. This is probably not the novel for you. You have to be kind of into that crazy stuff to, to a certain, and I definitely am. Uh, another sort of aside is the fact that someone even on Instagram said, jokingly, well, even, even if not, I don't care, but to me it's a joke. Uh, I thought only bros read this, you know, like the fact that there's a gendered aspect to who 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 reads the recognitions, which I which I really don't. I think Gaddis would, would very much have been against, from my sense of just. I don't think he's like that at all. He's not Hemingway. I mean, actually, Hemingway come up, comes up in the book as a joke, as a sort of there's a parody of Hemingway and his references. And you know, to my sense, to my mind, Gaddis just seems much more beyond that kind of silly 
you know, distinguishing who, what gender reads what, that's just, that would be too, too simplistic for him. And it's too simplistic for me too. So I guess I should tell you what is, what the book is about from my perspective and see that's already not so easy to say because of the, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's too muchness, but basically it is about, it focuses on this one fellow named Wyatt and his very strange being and he's an artist um i think gadda sort of seems to think of him as talented but not a genius because he's not he's very good at forge the forgeries that he does so you know he's a he's a counterfeiter he's a he's a forger of art but he's a very very good one he's very talented and he's an expert on pigments and colors and getting it just right and also how to age a painting you know you need a lot of expert knowledge to be a good forger of he is uh, obsessed with Flemish art of I guess Renaissance Flemish art I'm not quite sure which, which um and I'm glad that he is because that's kind of my I, I love that art too um as opposed to so that he apparently the character of Wyatt is based on another actual forger a Dutch man Hans someone and he forged different things. And that guy actually is documented as saying, I did it because I wasn't getting recognized as an artist. So you sort of see the whole, okay, in order to get recognized as an artist, to be forced to show your talent by imitating old paintings is, and and in the recognitions, it kind of gets co-opted because Wyatt is, is, is almost like a, I guess, is he Faust? Not really. Faust is one of the intertexts, but he gets picked up by a satanic or, or kind of devilish person, uh, Recto Brown, of, uh, you know, it's obviously a, a punny name, and another guy, Basil, Basil Valentine, and they both kind of work on him, they're pseudo-father figures, and they're art, art connoisseurs and art critics, and they're part of the business side of things, and so it's about the corruption of the art world in the sense they're they're all in on this forgery they're all in on the fact that they want to make money because they found someone who could be a really good forger and so they work on him and some of my favorite scenes are the interactions between the three of them the descriptions of how they're standing in a room and interacting and not interacting and how Gaddis has a very sort of interesting way of writing these scenes where for some reason hands are really important and people are always kind of folding their hands and he's always describing what their hands are up to and um these this is sort of fairly early on or midway in the book so it's about Wyatt and his life but it's also about kind of a picaresque of America at this time you know the specifically New York and in terms of places that it takes place so that started out with it almost like made me think it was taking place earlier than it was because it starts out in New England. And so it's New England Congregationalists. So, you know, what the Puritans turned into. And you do get this sense of it being kind of a puritanical, dark, unjoyous place that Wyatt grows up in with his father, who's very strange. And, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in the in the he's a pastor, he's a priest, uh, you know, a congregationalist pastor, and he wants, and apparently why it was destined to be one, but from, from the way he's depicted after he, he has an illness, and then he, even during the illness, he's always kind of painting, so for me, it's not like he became an artist, it's that he always was an artist, that's his, from the get-go, um, and another important character in the beginning is Aunt May, who I've forgotten a little bit because she does, you know, the novel moves away from his upbringing fairly quickly, but she's extremely puritanical. And she does hold sway over Wyatt because the mother has died um, because she's been uh, the victim of a botched surgery on the ship. And, you know, we're getting into the, the intricacies of the plot because the guy who did the botched surgery is going to reappear at the end. So he, 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 he's a medium-sized character who, who is a counterfeiter. So, you know, he, he counterfeits money and he'll come back and act as a sort of pseudo-father figure for, for Wyatt at the end. 
I don't want to get too much into the intricacies of this, the way the interweavings of the plot, but you know, so you have this counterfeiter, you have Wyatt who's doing the forgeries, and then it's sort of structured around quite a few um, very drawn out party scenes, so sort of set pieces where a party is described and you get all the little voices, all the little references to other artworks, other novels, and um, the party scenes are really, really interesting, and, and they're all quite different. And and so one of them at the end, so there's two party scenes at the end, well, not the end, but towards the end of the second part, I guess. And um, so one of them is interesting because what happens is if, and it, it does kind of, you know, relate to certain parties that one may have been to <laughs> in, in one's youth. <laughs> The way that at a party could kind of sort of disintegrate and people there's this there's a metaphor of devolution people will become more animalistic as the party continues not not in an orgy-esque way that would be too that wouldn't be gaddis but more in a specifically evolutionary way in the evolutionary manner i'm trying to think of a i can't find i probably won't be able to find the page where you know people turn into to prehistoric creatures and it's really well done and there is one character who's very strange and very creepy and does kind of, you know, creepy things. His name is Anselm. He's not characterized. He's, it's as if everything that comes out of his mouth is sort of obscene or rude or just kind of weird. And he's always weird. His interactions with all the characters are like that too. And one thing about Anselm is that through most of the novel, he seems to crawl around on all fours. Like... He'll even, there's a scene where after this one party, he'll, he'll go into the subway on all fours. And someone, I think it's supposed to be his mother, I don't know, is telling him to get up and he won't. So just wacky stuff too. There's a lot of wacky stuff in here. So, and some of it is really funny. So you get this sort of very serious earnest, when the narrative insertions are quite, quite beautifully written too. And sort of descriptions of the sky and the weather. But then you get a lot of the, the sort of more slapsticky, par par parodic descriptions of parties and people too. Uh, a lot of the minor characters are just sort of, they're just described as, as you know, they're just meant to be humorous and, and, and you know, parodies of actual people. Um, so let's see, I'm going to look at my notes. I did find one book by a cultural critic, a religion professor, philosophy professor at Columbia, he used to be William, and I'm just looking at a page that I printed out where he says, and so he's coming at us sort of from a theological point of view, he knows more about the theology stuff. Um, Gaddis is a writer's writer who asks big questions and tackles tough problems. His name, the, the book uh, is written by Mark C. Taylor. So Gaddis is a writer's writer who asks big questions and tackles tough problems. His works are as complicated as the issues they probe. Always ahead of the times, he saw things coming long before others even suspected important changes on, were on the horizon. The recognitions is, in my judgment, so this author's judgment, one of the most one of the two most important theological novels ever written, the other is Moby Dick. And then this is the sentence I do think is good. This work bridges past and future by showing the relationship between traditional religious beliefs and practices and contemporary social, economic, and technological developments. Um, Gaddis draws on ancient Christolog Christological controversies and discussions of both Christian Eucharist and Mithraic rites to illuminate psychological and social confl conflicts inherent in modern skepticism and secularism created by rapid technological change. Uh, good sentence. And so the Mithraic stuff, which about which I know very little, what happens is that the father of Wyatt becomes obsessed with Mithraic stuff and Mithraic rites. And there's actually a pretty funny scene at the end where he He's completely consumed by this and he's left the puritanical congregational stuff way behind and he actually holds the Mithraic rite in his church and his poor parishioners are kind of like what is going on <laughs> and I think he sort of he's 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 dismantled the church in weird ways and changed it into a, a, a sort of a place where he can do this and the parishioners are sort of they don't know what to make of this and he is removed and one thing I don't remember is how he, how he, he's, 
he's in a mental institution and he dies or is killed or something, but I don't quite remember why or how, what, no, how. But what happens is they get a new pastor, and I think his name is Dick, you know. <laughs> and he's sort of like the antithesis. Uh, he's a, sort of a very modern, uh, superficial, he does all the bad things, you know, like he gets rid of anything old and beautiful and the music and and just turns it into a more normal kind of and and the parish and the way it's written is really nicely done like the parish it says something like the parishes were okay with this but there there was a part of them that kind of missed the crazy stuff or missed the what the other guy was doing and and so um so Wyatt's father Reverend Guillaume both of them in a way are consumed with extreme ways of existing like he becomes so obsessed with um with rake with rakeism and and the cults and he's reading a lot and thinking a lot he's just obsessed with it he's uh, obsessed and Wyatt is obsessed with his art but there is a sort of innocence to that and a purity to that that none of the other characters exhibit um the fact it's and it's almost as if because especially with Wyatt who's incapable almost of holding a normal conversation because he's just so and in his own world it's kind of amazing that he actually did get married to someone but but that's because that person kind of grabbed him and said let's get married and he's there's a passivity there too so he just goes and does it that was sort of endearing so both of them even though they're sad creatures in a way they're they were also kind of in a way my favorite characters both of them and they both kind of they're not really act well the father definitely not and even well, why it does come to one of the parties, but they're not really at these parties. The parties are a little bit separate from these main people. Yeah, so I've already gone on for 14 minutes here, and I had that first part. I'm just going to look at my notes here. So, yeah, encyclopedic references to art, music, literature, are interwoven in different ways into the actual narrative. And it is sort of fun to figure it out to a certain degree, and after a while you're like, okay, sure <laughs> you can't just do it. it it there's an ever ending aspect to it and i think there's an also a diminishing returns on that even though it is wonderful forgery and the artist uh, i've talked about that that being kind of one of the main themes why it is an artist and a good one and one thing i wrote here is how to me he seems almost like he is an apprentice to the old masters he does kind of have this timeless quality too that he's not really living in the real world Recognizing the truth behind the facade and fakery of, fakery of a world ideal, that idealizes a certain transactional and anti-intellectual level of existence as epitomized by Dale Carnegie's How to Win Lens and Influence Them, which came out around this time, and also the proliferation of Reader's Digests. This is an indictment of that kind of way of interacting with the world, and it's connected to one of the sort of other sort of main characters, Mr. Pivner. So it's definitely um, Gad is not, you know, it's definitely an indictment of this anti-intellectual, you know, very middle brow, for lack of a better term, way of, um, yeah, and also the friend stuff too, the self-helpy type stuff. One thing that's important to remember is that only an expert or a connoisseur can recognize both forgeries and the original. Most of us are going to be like. And I was sort of thinking how this is the popularity of the antique road show is just to see someone who can actually tell the difference, explain as to, oh, this is why this isn't that. Oh, this is why this is that. We need these experts, these connoisseurs. We can't really do it on our own. Self-recognition, self-understanding. Most of the characters are not depicted with depth or, or interiority. Um, but uh, Depth is established through uh, well-written narrative insertions, often describing mundane phenomena such as the look of the sky or the surroundings of a character. So room descriptions, nature descriptions, weather descriptions, all really, really well done. And I've talked about the party scenes, and I've talked about Anselm. Anthropological metaphors underscore the idea that Gaddis did want to write a novel about humanity as a whole, and his attitude is cynical and paradistic. Um, and I guess I wrote here something I already kind of alluded to. I see the Wyatt thread and Wyatt set against the paradistic one. There's almost like there's different novels intertwined because of these different um, tones. There's tone shifts uh, too. 
yeah so i know this is still rather general but i hope i've given you a better idea of this novel from my own personal perspective um i did fall in love with the writing i didn't i and i did fall out of love a little bit at the end part of it was my own wish to be finished with it because it's sort of it did wear on me to be going through so slowly and the ending is different and and you you get less of the it's more just sort of wrapping up the the what has gone on before and actually i guess what uh, part of it is that it focuses on the character that i'm not that interested in even though at the end he has a, he, he he comes in at the end and that's kind of interesting i think we're going to leave it here <laughs> babble 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 it's a fantastic novel. I'm really glad that I've read it. And so for you guys, should you read this novel, I I would urge you all to not be intimidated by it. Uh, what's intimidating by it is its length. But it's not that intimidating to read. I mean, you're all readers. Most of us are here because we read books all the time. And especially at the beginning. I mean, I go back to this uh, one booktube, a big booktube, with the book chemist who gave up on it. And I could sort of see how he wasn't entirely wrong that nothing, that he gave, he gave up. Maybe he could have gone a little bit longer to get a few. But, but I could, he sort of said, okay, I figured out what this, what this is all about. And it's, it's novelty. And then he sort of, well, the novelty's worn off and I'm just, I'm just done with it. And I think that's that's part of it is that it's just so big. And so you have to sort of, um, it, it's, it is a bit of a challenge to read such a big, heavy book with all these references that never, that never seems quite to stop. <laughs> and, um, but on the other hand, don't be intimidated. Uh, I guess either way, I mean, it's sort of fine to just read it and then say, okay, this is not for me. Um, I'm glad I got through it. Uh, I'm trying to think if I had known what I know about it now before I started reading, would I have started it? Well, that's a hard question. I'm glad I read it though, because I was sort of intrigued by the the, the cultish aspects and the encyclopedic aspects. And I was, I was actually surprised by how wonderfully written certain parts of it are. It's a beautifully written book and I do, I feel sorry for him to have written such a masterpiece that wasn't appreciated and I'm glad that he later on with his other novels did get more appreciation, and did get more recognition. So because to write such a sort of heavy piece of literature and it to fall flat so so badly must have been quite humbling and in a way I, I respect him so much for rallying and coming back with J.R. and his other novels. So good for him you know, good for him. Thank you all for watching. Sorry about it not being very, you know, clean and clear. And I will talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.